A story that we wanted to cover because Antrim GEA tweeted last night from their own Twitter account pictures of Caseman Park and uh, it was uh, pretty awful stuff when you consider that this is the field of dreams for uh, young Antrim GEA folk and indeed for the, uh, the older Antrim GEA folk, the um, rank and file club members. Uh, the photographs show a, a pitch absolutely overgrown the stands in Brack and Ruin effectively and it has fallen into disrepair and disgrace. Declan Bogue is on the line to talk to us a bit about this this morning. Declan, uh, Anthem GA tweeted, how many children will miss out playing at Caseman Park? We deserve a county ground, hashtag GA. It would be nice to move it forward. Um, what's going on here? Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Owen. Uh, what is going on here is nothing but inertia over the last number of years. I mean, actually, you know, those photographs that you refer to are so dramatic looking. You know, you talk about urban decay. A number of years ago, some enterprising farmer actually took bales off the pitch, which um, an awful lot of herders who would have came up to play Antrim when they are going well would have said that after Thurlis, it possibly was the best hurling surface in the planet. Uh, but... Uh, just a, a brief part of history of what's going on. In February, in February of 2014, so, uh, uh, they had they had been told that their initial plans for a 38,000 seater stadium was being turned back because of you know concerns over the height of certain stands and stuff like that. They're very keen to have it all seater. I don't really understand. They could have got round this by having some kind of terrace. But anyway, that was turned down for concerns over safety. And uh, in February of last year, then they submitted another plan, a revised plan, but there has been no word since. Because <clears throat> really, Ger, like we're heading to over 500 uh, days of no storm and government, no storm and executive. And while they thought that some senior civil servants might be able to give the green light on these things, another uh, an incinerator project costing over 200 million was turned down recently. And that in, in May of this year, and then they have basically said that you know senior civil servants aren't able to make these decisions. So Casement Park probably will not be. There'll be no decision made until Stormont is up and running again, if ever. That's a bit mad, isn't it? Because it means that planning is now entirely a political issue, and that's the type of thing that leads to corruption really quickly, as we can all attest to from our own history. Some might say that that's always been the case up here too. Look. Jerry, you know, I mean, plan, <laughs> nothing could surprise you about how things are operated in the North, really. It doesn't, I have to say, it doesn't. But at the same time, you would assume that the planning process is like, yeah, you come for planning and you don't actually need a rubber stamp from the government because, well, that's like, then it means the government has veto on what gets built and what doesn't get built, and that automatically leads to political favours. Yes, yes. I, 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 which is... <laughs> Look, I mean, that's par for the course. Like, what, what's probably more concerning is that, like, since uh, Antrim handed over this ground to the Ulster Council, like, and don't forget, like, this was more or less in Antrim's gift. They basically handed this ground over to the Ulster Council to do what they wanted with it, and they would, you know, then get to use it off the Ulster Council. So it's left Antrim entirely without a ground. They play most of their football games in Corrigan Park in West Belfast, and they tend to move the hurling games around different clubs and it's just woefully inadequate. And also, this has cost ten million. This has cost ten million before a saw has been turned, you know. It, it's just entirely unacceptable, like and it's been there's been a, a, some mismanagement, but also like, you know, the the GA have had huge roadblocks put in their way and it nothing's been above board either. So Arlene Foster obviously was at a big GA match this summer. A whole heap was made of it. Is there a possibility that if Stormont comes back that this is the type of thing that gets fast-tracked as a result of some of the stuff that's happening in the background? You might hope so. Um, you, may, you know, you might hope so. <laughs> that's all. Hey, forgive me for being sort of apathetic about it, like, but you know, at this point, it's been going on for years, and like Stormont hasn't been, it's been down for over 500 days, but before that, there was very little traction and very little appetite to actually get Casement Park going. You know, there was, it was cause for celebration among some that the, the thing was being held up for so long. It was the GA, after all, that wanted to have a multi-purpose stadium at the site of the former H-blocks, like in, in Long Cash, and, uh, you know, that, that that wasn't ever going to be the case among the, you know, 
the other rugby and soccer uh, associations didn't want that to be the case uh, and funding was granted to upgrade Kingspan, funding was granted to make Windsor Park into a national stadium but yet when the GA come looking for their slice of it you know, it's just kept off and kept off like you know It's pretty clear cut though, like this is the type of stuff that you know back in the day would have happened on a local level and it would have bred simmering resentment. This is like writ large. It's a, a, a brand spanking, gleaming Kingspan Ravenhill, a brand spanking Windsor Park, which is hosting world title fights. And then there's like weeds growing in Casement mm-hmm. Park. You can't hide well, that. You put it in those terms, yeah. It's pretty stark, isn't it? Yeah. Like, what? So I hadn't seen these photographs before and I can totally understand why, you know, the people who live cheek by jowl with this, it, it kind of insidiously is something that you almost not accept but are like, okay, well, that's just how things are. But like, fair play to the Antrim County Board or whoever runs their Twitter account last night for putting the picture out there because it's pretty grotesque, really, when you think about it. Like, ultimately, it's not grotesque that they're not developing a stadium, but it's grotesque that what, what appears to be selective refurbishment of particular sports which are identified with a particular community are favoured over another community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Am I wrong so with that? You can only go on the evidence that we have. Like, you know, you, you can only really say... You, let's not forget, there was a plan application turned down and the plan application was reasons for that, you know. And there was a judicial review done on that and, like, still... So, I mean, I, I can't... I can't you can't totally attribute entirely all the blame to politicians. Like if if things weren't in order with a planning application, if and, and there was concerns over the egresses and where people would exit the stadium, uh, the kind of tra- human traffic that would be on a particular on the Anderson Road at that particular time. Um, so I, I don't like. Maybe there's feelings on all sides here. Like, you know, it'd be very easy for us to say, right, this is the problem, and it all falls down onto the side of politicians from one side of the house. And I'm not so sure that that can be our ultimate position on it. Okay. Like, um, I was up recently, and Anderson Town Road is uh, a mass of roadworks and apparently has been for a long period of time. It would have been possible maybe to do those roadworks in conjunction with the redevelopment of the stadium and have that traffic plan in place. Like, so perhaps there isn't joined up thinking going on and it doesn't feel like there's a will to make everybody get onto the same page. Yeah, I mean, they could do the boy like you up there, <laughs> for the sounds of it, and you've considered this and you've teased this out. Like, but you know what I mean? All those kind of departments are separate departments too, like roads and planning and all that, you know, is... It would be, it would take an awful lot of creative thinking, and sometimes that's not in abundance. Like, and especially when it's just total inertia and there's nothing happening, you're not going to get that in the first instance. Yeah, um, you don't seem particularly hopeful that anything is actually going to come of this. I mean, at least perhaps it can be brought to public attention. There could be a conversation held about it, but ultimately, it sounds like um, this is kind of pushing the same rock up the same hill. Yeah, look, you know. Uh, people in Antrim, you know, that they really are crying out for. Uh, um, they're crying out for some kind of status in the Gale, right? Um, the Gale Fast funding was announced, and there was a million to be spent over the next five years, right? I'll give you an example. I don't know how you are for time, Jerry. Yeah, that, yeah no, we're great. Short anecdote: like, with Jonathan Ross or one of the Antrim's premier clubs, I think they're third on the list of Antrim Senior Hurling Championships. They're a serious, proper hurling cha- club. And Simon McNaught was telling me last Thursday that he went up to see Cushing Doyle and Rossa play the other day and it was something like 6-27 to one to, to, to 7 points and Rossa only scored 2 points in the second half there wasn't even a single person from a Donovan Rossa the Premier Hurling Club in Belfast at the game he says he went down to the game in Rossa in West Belfast on a fine summer evening 6 weeks previous to that and he says there was only about 2 or 3 people watching it and there's one sub uh, I mean, if that can, and, and, and now there's obviously Rasa have problems with injuries, and a lot of their hurlers went to America for the summer. But I mean, in general, hurling and football in Belfast 
is not thriving. Like There are some clubs that are really making a serious fist of things and going well, but there are probably too many clubs and they're a hangover of the time when everybody socialised in West Belfast and stayed in West Belfast, right? You know, that doesn't really happen anymore. Belfast is much more open and inclusive for all areas. But it's generally sport in the city, Gaelic games in the city is suffering a little bit. It's big time suffering. Like even just if you look at like you know, the South West would be traditionally seen as the big area for football. Now, a lot of the sort of titles were won, have been won by City teams in the recent way, but underneath it all, the participation levels and stuff like that, it is not going well. And that's why it's kind of discouraging to hear, like, you know, I think it was John Horan that said at the funding, at the announcement of the funding of this Gale Fast project that, you know, they'll need to see results pretty quick. I mean, this is going to take, like, to, in order to rejuvenate and get Belfast GA going and thriving, this is a 20 year project. And, you know, given the kind of funding that has been thrown out to other counties and for the duration of that, for, you know, for a five year project to be announced for one million, which, let's face it, on, the, on you know, that is kind of paltry, really, when you're talking about that level of funding, and for a threat to be put over the head of the guy Paul Donnelly who hasn't even started the job yet, I think is pretty cheap. And so, like, the redevelopment of Casement Park and having big games coming to the middle of West Belfast would have been a symbolic thing for Antrim Gales. It would have been symbolic for Belfast Gales. And I feel for them because it's not happening. You talk about the, the Gale Fast funding. Like, you could see fairly quick, returns on that investment in terms of the number of kids playing and the number of kids staying playing. I saw some stats recently about the number of kids in Limerick City who were playing in schools and the percentage, hurling mm -hmm. this is, and the percentage was really low and then they put a project in place and the percentage grew really rapidly because... I think it was 8% to 52% or something, wasn't it? Was it? A, it, it was crazy it, figures. Yeah, it was an incredible turnaround. And it, I remember being so shocked by them that I didn't actually want to quote them to you there because it, it they sound... <laughs> exactly, they, they sound so... Amazing, but like there was a sense in recent years that certainly middle class Belfast, middle class nationalist Belfast had started to return to the GAA and those new clubs uh, were being particularly well run and were, were kind of coming out from under the shadow of the troubles. Is that not the case in across? That's, that's absolutely the legacy of Bridget's have a brilliant uh, they share training facilities with Harlequins, uh, rugby, uh, I'm sure. Joe Brady has been on the, the on the show in the past talking about this. Uh, Breda has just exploded in terms of numbers. Uh, people coming to them. Kerry Duff, I think it was. In, well, no, they're not. They're specifically not Antrim, but they are a suburb of Belfast. Have, uh, of all the down clubs, they had the most of any of the cool camps over the summer last summer, which was astonishing. Like you know, for, for an area like Kerry Duff. Um, the one problem. I'll return to that issue. I said there's probably too many clubs in Belfast, right? You see, they're like a, and this comes from me from youth coaches in the in the county in Belfast, is that if Gilfast did, right, say that they had a, a revolution similar to what you're talking about in Limerick and from 8% going to 52%, right? What the clubs will find is they don't actually have enough volunteers on the ground then to cope with those kind of numbers because uh, and I'm involved in youth coaching myself, Ger, you know, you have to have a certain amount of parents or a certain amount of adults to a certain amount of children, and they're simply overwhelmed by it. And then in the first couple of weeks when that, those kind of things happen, they can't cope with the numbers, and then they find that the numbers gradually drift away. You know, John Martin, for example, is a coach in Ardoin, uh, Kickham's club, and uh, he's a columnist with Gaelic Life, and he told me that he went cap in hand to all the local primary schools around North Belfast, explaining the virtues of hurling, could call in sport, all oh, this, you can come to us and we will look after you well. And he said he spent weeks basically blitzing all these primary schools and giving his pitch, and he got one extra child who didn't stay <laughs> after two weeks. Yeah. Like, you know, it's going to be very hard, but, you know, the, yeah, so this is a, a, a conversation I seem to have every time I speak to, you know, Samuel McNaughton, too. He goes in, he teaches, it's all about trying to get the enthusiasm into the children. Like, he teach, he used to go in and coach schools in Larn, which is particularly uh, non GA environment, let's just say, and found that the children loved it. But 
you have to have a structure in place then for them to actually progress. You can't just go into a school and have 50 children eating out of your hand because this is a character, he's taking a lovely training session, it's so entertaining. Yeah. You need then somewhere for them to progress to and that that place there needs to be equipped and that's what a lot of this Gale Fast thing needs to look into is what are the viabilities of some of these clubs and how can we strengthen them? Yeah. Like, is, I mean, I don't know. The point you're making that this is a, a, a circular conversation and that there is 500 days, 500 odd days of inaction at Stormont. Can anything fix this, like, soon? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't really just, understand the question. Okay, I mean, uh, let me let me, let me rephrase it. Yeah, any sorry. Progress can we, be made. Is go on ahead, Terry. So we um, we do stuff with uh, Ross Tucker, the science and sport guy, who who talks about mm -hmm. dope testing, and he always comes back to the same phrase: where there's a will, there's a way. And at the moment, there's no will to change anti-doping worldwide, so it's not going to happen. If there was a will, there probably is a way to restore GAA in Belfast to a position where. It is well organised, well run, well funded, and returning on investment in terms of having uh, volunteers come and want to be associated, and having kids stay and uh, be part of the GAA community. Is there? Does that will exist in the right places? If we take the two, we have to take the two in isolation, right? Just forget about Casement Park at the moment, like, um, and just say, is there a will? The prob there is a will. Is there a way, you know, I mean, if you're talking, if you're relying on, like, you know, politicians to deliver a stadium, they're very, you know, look, you know, they've been off work for a long time and they have to fill their days. And you see various politicians going along and making a big play about, oh, we went to the BBC today to make representation that there should be more Gaelic games on BBC and I. Knowing rightly that these contracts are signed, seen, delivered for the next number of years, nothing's going to change. Like, you know what I mean? Then you see them, you know, making sure that, they get their picture taken at the offices of RT to talk about geo-blocking against Gaelic Games not being able to see in the north. And, like, I mean, all these things are just token. They're, 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 there's no substance to it because they can't change anything because they know that this is legalities that they're coming up against. Now, so put that to one side. Are you, are you going to... Uh, get a rejuvenated Antrim GA and in particular Belfast GA that has to come from within and it has to be an exclusively a GA thing and that has to be uh, funded and provided there has to be there's a certain amount of coaches I forget the figure there's six coaches going into all the schools in Belfast six or four not sure but then there needs to be uh, some kind of effort to rejuvenate the clubs and that has to come from within but uh, probably what you're going to have to do here Seriously, and this is, it would be a hugely unpopular position, but you're going to have to say, right, I'll tell you what, we just want five football clubs, five hurling clubs. If that means amalgamating a lot of clubs, then so be it. But that's kind of the way it has to be for volunteers, for numbers, and then to get the thing concentrated. And at the moment, it's like the Wild West. Clubs are pension players from all sorts of schools and families, and you get the situation whereby, like, <laughs> Antrim County final last year, Donald Nugent and uh, his brother... Connor Nugent was sent off for actually striking his brother Donald Nugent on opposition teams in the county final. That's the kind of you get an awful lot of that in Belfast. Like, and what needs to happen is concentrated. If you want to call them super clubs, then so be it. But that's that's your first start. Declan, it um, seems labyrinth time, but thanks very much for explaining to explaining it to us this morning. Ropey enough, Ger, but I got through it. <laughs> That's great stuff. Declan Bog there with us this morning on OTBAM, talking about those photographs that the Antrim County Board uh, tweeted last night. Pretty stark, right? And you can see how it just becomes something that becomes part of your life, and you go, okay, well, that's just that situation that we have over there at the moment.